Cruel. 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 Not a nice guy. He ruled the world's mightiest empire with sadistic brutality. He was vindictive and dangerous and irresponsible. His reign of terror lasted just 1,400 days. Yet even today, everyone knows his name. He really is the personification of evil. The stories that we have, the things that they tell us are quite extreme. Most say he was crazy, but was he? Psychopathic, evil, oh yes. Clinically insane. This is the story few know behind one of the most infamous figures of the ancient world. This is Caligula. Caligula's story takes place in the first century AD, less than 20 years after the death of Jesus Christ. The Roman Empire is the world's greatest superpower. With its vast armies, Rome dominates over two million square miles around the Mediterranean Sea, an area occupied today by 47 countries. Its total population is estimated at 55 million, which means one in every four people on Earth live under Roman law. And all of it is under the control of one man, a 24-year-old named Caligula. Even though he ruled more than 2,000 years ago, today Caligula is still remembered for being a madman. He was the original over-the-top emperor. You have the stories of the horse, you have the stories of him sleeping with his sister, and the stories got around. We know the stories now. We're still talking about them 2,000 years later. According to one story, a senator's wife catches Caligula's eye, and he invites her and her husband to dine with him, an offer they can't dare refuse. In the midst of the banquet, Caligula has her brought back to his private chambers. And he enjoys her while his guests are enjoying their meal. To make matters worse, afterwards, Caligula returns to the banquet, and he goes on to tell all of the guests, including the woman's husband, exactly how well the woman had performed. Stories like these have kept Caligula's name alive, but are they true? The ancient sources, of course, show him as an evil tyrant who deserved to die. It's really hard to sift through and understand who Caligula was. We do know that he was excessive. We do know that he was vindictive. We do know that he was paranoid. But was he really as crazy as they say? He's not an out-and-out, -out crazy, completely self-destructive person. To understand if Caligula was as mad as history has labeled him, you have to take a closer look at all of the stories of brutality and excess. And it starts on his first day as emperor. Caligula's reign begins with a triumphant procession up the Appian Way, Rome's most famous road. Huge crowds cheer him on and throw flowers in his path. To the people, the fresh-faced 24-year-old represents a new hope. He isn't especially well-known, and there are huge expectations on him. When he reaches Rome, Caligula heads right to the Curia Julia, the traditional meeting hall of the Roman Senate. He needs them to legitimize his new role as emperor. For centuries, the Senate made up of men from the wealthiest and most distinguished families, was in charge of Rome. But 68 years ago, 
Everything changed when Augustus Caesar seized power over the Senate and all of Rome. Now, the empire is ruled by one man. Augustus brought peace to the empire for 41 years. His adopted son, Tiberius Caesar, ruled for the next 23 years. But by the end of his reign, Tiberius wasn't winning any popularity contests. At the end of his reign, the people hated Tiberius. He raised their taxes, he cut down on public games and festivals. He was stingy with the wealth of the empire. That's why they put their hopes in Caligula. Now, Augustus' great-grandson, Caligula, is ready to step into the role as Rome's third emperor. But first, he needs the Senate's approval. You have to remember that the Senate had just been through a terrible period under the Emperor Tiberius. The last part of his reign was full of fear, was conspiracy trials, senators turning on each other, and they really hoped for something better from Caligula. As far as the senators and the people of Rome are concerned, Caligula has the perfect pedigree. His mother was the granddaughter of the popular Augustus, and his father Germanicus was one of Rome's greatest and most honored generals. As a child, Caligula grew up in remote outposts like this, among rough and ready soldiers. But as the son of the commander, very aware of his privileges. Caligula's parents constantly remind the young boy of his noble heritage and the high expectations they have for him. From the beginning, his mother groomed him for greatness. She dressed up little Gaius Germanicus in a tiny soldier's uniform and paraded him round the camp to win over the soldiers. It worked. They loved him. They called him Caligula, Little Boots. And even though he hated the name, it stuck. Caligula is only seven years old and living in Syria where his father Germanicus was on assignment. Suddenly, his father falls ill. Worse, it turns out he was poisoned. A terrible way for a soldier to go. And rumor has it, it was on the orders of the emperor himself. The emperor at the time is Tiberius, Caligula's great uncle. He feared Germanicus's growing popularity among his soldiers and the people. So he ordered his best general poisoned to death. Caligula watches his father die for the crime of being too popular. It's a lesson in the ruthlessness of imperial power that he would never forget. But Tiberius doesn't stop there. When Caligula and his grieving family return to Rome, the emperor continues to persecute them, convinced that they are still a threat to his power. Tiberius has both Caligula's mother and eldest brother arrested on the charge of treason and they're ultimately exiled out to a barren rock in the middle of nowhere. His mother starves herself to death and his eldest brother commits suicide. Tiberius has Caligula's other brother thrown into a cell beneath the palace. There, the young man starves to death, but not before trying to eat his own mattress. The death of his parents and brothers will have a profound influence on the young Caligula. If your nearest relations disappear rather casually, as it were, this puts some toughness in you and um, makes you pretty unpleasant. It's not really surprising that he ends up slightly unhinged. But Tiberius spares the young man, at least for a time. He only survived because he was too young to really be a threat. When Caligula turns 17, he receives a summons from the emperor. He is to come to Tiberius's magnificent palace on the island of Capri, off the coast of Naples. On Capri, the emperor has set up a new imperial court where he can do anything he wants, far from prying eyes, 
folks thought when Tiberius called him to the uh, to his court at Capri that that was going to be the end of uh, the young Caligula. It is very difficult to understand what Caligula would have been thinking when he arrived here at Tiberius's villa on Capri. It was probably a combination of both apprehension and excitement. Apprehension because of what had already happened to his family and what could potentially happen to him. And yet enthusiasm because he was arriving here at the true seat of Roman imperial power under Tiberius. When Caligula arrives at the palace, to everyone's surprise, Tiberius welcomes him and takes him under his wing. Tiberius is getting older and he needs to find a successor. The only option is that of Germanicus' son, Gaius Julius Caesar, otherwise known as Caligula. It will be Caligula's first taste of what it truly means to be emperor. But the world Caligula enters on Capri is unlike anything he or anyone has seen before. It's a hellhole of despotism and debauchery. Most of this villa was actually decorated with pornographic imagery on the walls, a bit like the ancient Roman equivalent of the Kama Sutra. Tiberius was having young boys and young girls running around in the gardens outside of the villa, scantily clad, having sexual encounters, and he would sit there and watch. In his large indoor pool, Tiberius swims naked with his young guests, affectionately calling them his minnows. Caligula is encouraged to join in, and he does, because the punishment for upsetting the emperor is often death. Tiberius likes to have his victims hurled off the rock cliffs next to his palace, 1,000 feet down into the sea. The closer you got to imperial power, the higher the stakes. Death was a daily threat if you were on Capri. On Capri, Caligula receives an education in violence, pleasure, and the intoxicating effects of absolute power. We all know about the orgies, that's the bit everyone remembers. But the important thing to remember is, is, is that he was a captive. He was being held there effectively against his will knew how to survive under very, very close watch. But while he was being watched, he was also watching. Caligula knows that if he can survive life on Capri, he will inherit his great uncle's empire. Caligula spent six years living here on Capri with Tiberius. This had a profound impact upon him. It taught him not only how to wield absolute power, but also taught him about how to enjoy himself. Caligula pretends to go along for the ride and secretly waits for his chance to take the throne. Caligula knows that the surest way to power is to secure the loyalty of the Praetorian Guard, the men hired to protect the Emperor. The Praetorian Guard are the Emperor's personal protection force. They go wherever he goes. But these aren't palace guards. These are well-trained, well-armed soldiers. Best to think of them as a cross between Navy SEALs and the Secret Service. Caligula befriends the captain of the Praetorians, a man named Macro, and promises him power and influence in exchange for his support, when the time comes. Caligula was definitely waiting for his opportunity to succeed Tiberius. He's ultimately a very ambitious young man. He saw it as being his destiny. And when Tiberius falls ill at the age of 77, Caligula seizes the opportunity. The ancient sources claim that Caligula tried to suffocate Tiberius. He allegedly smothers the frail emperor in his bed, avenging the death of his family. And Macro, supposedly in charge of protecting the emperor, looks the other way. Caligula was the first Roman emperor to bribe the Praetorian Guard to get his post, and he would not be the last. In fact, actually, he set the model for all subsequent Roman emperors. Macro commands the Praetorian Guards to support Caligula as their new emperor, 
and they escort him back to Rome up the Appian Way in force. This is the background of the young man who appears before the Senate of Rome to claim the throne. He followed Tiberius, who was mighty unpopular by the time he died. This must have seemed the beginning of a new chapter. He makes a speech that really wows the Senate. He is everything that the Senate has wanted in an emperor. He is humble, he is deferential, he even calls himself their son. And they're so impressed with him that they decide they're going to vote him all the honours that Augustus and Tiberius had. He's done nothing yet to prove himself, but he is going to be their emperor. Rome has welcomed Caligula. He is now ruler of the world's greatest empire and his reign is just beginning. But how long will it be until Rome realizes that they may have crowned a madman? Today, Caligula is remembered as one of ancient Rome's most terrifying, most insane emperors. But when he first came to power, Rome had high hopes for its new young leader. When Caligula came to power, he was only 24. He was an incredibly young man. All most Romans knew about him was that he was the great-grandson of Rome's first emperor, Augustus Caesar, and that his granduncle, the Emperor Tiberius, had murdered most of Caligula's immediate family. What has he done before in his life? What experiences does he have? Well, apparently nothing good. With all of his relatives being killed and being held hostage on Capri. Well, there's got to be a lot of warping going on there. To give that kind of man total power of the Roman Empire was an insane thing to do. As the new emperor of Rome, the young Caligula controls more than an empire. He also controls all its wealth. The Rome that Caligula inherits is rich, thanks to the solid management of its first it has grown in power, and the imperial treasury is full. Now, Caligula starts to put this money to work, and he begins by buying the support and confidence of those who matter. Caligula takes up residence in the palace of Tiberius, and from here, he embarks upon a massive PR campaign. He has to win over the Senate and the people of Rome, and maybe, most importantly, the Praetorian Guard. Macro, the head of the Praetorian Guard, and the man who helped Caligula come to power, suggests that the young emperor give his soldiers a little something extra. In his will, Tiberius leaves each member of the Praetorian Guard a thousand gold sesterces. That's the equivalent of a year's pay. On the advice of Macro, Caligula doubles it. It's an important move. If he is going to keep his power, Caligula has to make sure the Praetorian Guard is on his side. They'll be his torturers, they'll be his enforcers, they'll do his dirty work for him. Caligula needs them happy and loyal, and they are. Caligula also gives the head of every family in Rome a cash gift, equivalent to $1,000 in today's money. Think of it as an ancient economic stimulus act. But Caligula wants to make sure that people remember exactly who is giving them the money. So he does something a little extreme. Where we're standing is the Basilica Julia. Now this is one of the great public halls of Rome. The building stands about three stories high in modern terms, about 60 feet high. Caligula climbs to the top of the building, armed with a surprise. He has buckets of coins, which he hurls from 60 feet up, and these metal missiles pelt the people who scramble to get it. And those who aren't injured by that, well, they run the risk of being trampled in the crush to pick up the coins from the street below. Over all of this smiles the beneficent emperor. Caligula has gotten the people of Rome, as well as the Praetorian Guard, on his side. But he must also win over the Senate. He goes to them with a promise. Things will be different than they were under the last emperor. 
Tiberius wasn't very popular by the end of his reign because he undertook a series of treason trials against his senatorial peers. Tiberius used the threat of treason to keep the Senate in check. Anyone could be accused and convicted of conspiring against the emperor, even if they'd done nothing wrong. No senator was safe. Now, Caligula promises to change all this. A few months into his reign, Caligula denounces the hated treason trials. He abolishes them and he offers an amnesty to anybody implicated in them. And then, in one final dramatic gesture, he burns all of the documents that had the evidence against the senators. Finally, there will be peace between the emperor and the senate. He even appears to make peace with the past, adopting Tiberius' grandson, a 14-year-old boy named Gamellus, as his own heir. I think the whole thing really is a big PR stunt. I mean, Caligula is 24 years old. He's going to have a long reign in front of him. Giving attention to Gamellus and adopting him costs him nothing. But devotion to family and interest in succession is going to make him look good to the Senate and the people of Rome. With everyone's support secured, Caligula's first six months in power are a resounding success. 187 days into Caligula's rule, the Senate grants him the highest possible honor of the Roman Empire, the title Pater Patriae, Father of the Country. His word is now law. He is the undisputed master of Rome. Suddenly to get all that power, having done nothing in particular towards it, with all the fawning and admiration and so on, you'd have to be a very special person not to have it turn your head. But then Caligula gets an unpleasant reminder of his limits. <laughs> and we don't know exactly what happens, but it's certain that Caligula suddenly falls ill, and it's serious, and it lasts for weeks. Nobody knows what's going to happen. It's like the whole empire is holding its breath. Word quickly spreads far and wide that the new beloved emperor is at death's door. The people hold vigils outside the palace. Commerce comes to a halt. But not every citizen of the empire is paralyzed with fear. The head of the Praetorian Guard, Macra, who pledged his allegiance to Caligula, abandons him. Macro does what he did before when Tiberius was ill. He prepares for the worst. He spends a lot of time with Gamellus, Caligula's adopted heir. He encourages him to make public appearances to reassure the people. And he starts to groom the young man for the throne. But Caligula surprises everyone. He makes a full recovery. And when he looks around at the situation, he's not very pleased with what he sees. Gamellus has stepped up, and he looks pretty comfortable in that position. Caligula realizes that with Gamellus around, he's always replaceable. Caligula orders the boy arrested and imprisoned. But that's not all. Caligula sends his Praetorian guards to Gamellus' cell. Now, since it's forbidden for soldiers to spill imperial blood, he gives him strict orders that Gamellus must take his own life. Now, Gamellus doesn't even know how to use a sword, and so he has to ask the soldiers for help. And they show him how to insert the sword to die as painlessly as possible. Gamellus proves to be a quick study, and he takes his own life. Caligula orders the death of his 14-year-old cousin. It is the turning point in his reign, the moment when the terror begins. Because he doesn't stop there. Caligula really feels betrayed by Macro, the man that helped him become the emperor in the first place. But he can't simply kill the head of the Praetorian Guard. That's when he does something brilliant. He promotes him and appoints him the prefect of Egypt. Caligula appoints new commanders for the Praetorian Guard. And then he makes his move. Before Macro can leave for Egypt, Caligula has him arrested for treason. He's presented with a sword and told to take the honorable way out. 
Macro is also forced to commit suicide. And Caligula claims another victim. There will be many, many more. When Caligula became ill, a certain nobleman declared publicly that he would gladly give his own life for the emperor to recover. When Caligula recovers, he then finds the nobleman and obliges him to fulfill his vow. He has him dragged through the streets and thrown into the Tiber where he drowns. This reveals the true nature of Caligula. If folks were going to make statements like that, he was going to call them on it. And this is what he did. Brutality like this is nothing new in ancient Rome. That's how people got and held on to power. But Caligula's reign of terror is just beginning because he will prove to have an appetite for power like no other man in history. Now he's got the reins of the empire. He can do whatever he wants. So he can be wanton. He can be irresponsible. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to be doing whatever it is I want to do. He also will reveal an appetite for sex as a tool for inflicting both pleasure and pain. When you want to talk about an emperor's excesses, uh, sexual, it's Caligula. During his first six months as the ruler of ancient Rome, Caligula secured his position by buying off the people and the military. But his reign of terror began when he killed off his 14-year-old cousin his only legitimate successor. Now that he has achieved absolute power over the largest empire on earth, he does what probably any 25-year-old would do in his circumstances. He parties. One year into power, and life is good for Caligula. He's dining on exotic foods shipped in from all over the empire, throwing lavish parties at his palace. Upper-class Romans would often throw banquets as a way of displaying their wealth and prestige. But Caligula takes it to a whole new level. His guests feast on exotic delicacies like flamingo tongue, camel heels, and roasted ostrich. One banquet in particular cost 10 million sesterces. That's the annual revenue of three Roman provinces combined. This is a guy with an appetite for pleasure. I mean, he was an addict. With his drinking, with his attitude toward food, he even adapted a specific poison to extend his stomach so he could eat even more. It's the sort of opposite of a vomitorium. It was also very hard for someone coming from his background, growing up in the environment that he did, not to be a glutton, not to indulge in extreme sexual activity. All Rome is talking about Caligula's exotic and erotic parties and his unnatural relationship with his youngest sister, Drusilla. One of the first nouns that come to mind when one thinks of Caligula is incest. It's an open secret. All of Rome is whispering that Caligula is sleeping with his youngest sister, Drusilla. At banquets, he gives her the position of honor, lavishes her with attention, feeds her with his own hand, and even caresses her, all in front of her own husband. Caligula's sister Drusilla is married to one of Caligula's close friends, a man named Lepidus. But word on the street is it was just to keep her close. Romans liked talking about sex, and scandal about sex was great to talk about. Lepidus has no reason to complain about the arrangement. As Caligula's brother-in-law, now he's next in line for the throne. But could Caligula's relationship with his sister have been more than just sexual? It's possible that he did have some notion in mind of developing a pure royal line along the line of the Ptolemies in Egypt. This is the thing that pharaohs did. This is all part of his, you know, love of Eastern culture and doing a, an Eastern type of emperor thing. The only thing Caligula seems to enjoy more than sex is violence. Go! 
Caligula was a huge fan of blood sport, especially gladiator fights. And the bloodier the sport, the better. Arenas are filled with screaming, shrieking, frenzied fans. And Caligula's right there, screaming alongside them. Gladiator combat has been part of Rome's culture for over 200 years. Usually, the gladiators are former enemy soldiers captured in battle who are then trained to fight one another for the amusement of the masses. But Caligula wants to make Rome's favorite pastime more vicious by changing the rules. It would be like the American president changing the rules to baseball. Gladiator fights are sacred to the Romans, but Caligula wants more blood, so he creates mismatches. One gladiator gets a sword, the other only a net. One fighter gets a shield, the other none at all. This dramatically increases the carnage. And not just human carnage. Roman arenas often staged special shows that featured men hunting down wild beasts. Caligula begins importing exotic animals from all over the empire. Lions, tigers, and bears, and even elephants and has them slaughtered in numbers never before seen, all for the public's entertainment. According to one story, an amphitheater begins running low on food for all the animals it's keeping, so Caligula orders them to use prisoners as food instead. Throwing criminals to the lions is nothing new in Rome. The Romans had a peculiar notion of combining popular entertainment, such as gladiatorial combat, with public executions and, and criminal punishment. But Caligula doesn't stop there. Anyone who dares to boo the emperor is plucked from the stands by Caligula's guards and thrown into the arena. More food for the animals. But first, he likes to see their tongues cut out so there's no complaining. Caligula's love of public spectacle isn't always so bloody. He also enjoys the theater. He gets so involved in these shows that he jumps up on stage and starts acting out all the parts. And who's going to stop him? He loves the dressing up. He loves the drama. He loves the performance. And he can do it because he's the emperor. But Caligula's absolute favorite hobby is horse racing. More than anything else, Caligula loves horse racing. He goes to the races, he hoots and hollers with the crowd, he lays down vast amounts of money as bets. But more than this, he visits the stables, he rewards the charioteers, he throws parties for them. More than anybody else, Caligula takes professional horse racing at Rome to the next level. And the people love him for this. Caligula holds horse races from dawn to dusk, and breaking with tradition, attends nearly every race himself especially the ones held at the great Circus Maximus, the Churchill Downs of ancient Rome. We're talking a quarter of a million people in the Circus Maximus at the Great Games. It was a fantastic opportunity to show the Roman people that he was one of them. But just as with the theater, Caligula wants to do more than just watch. He wants to participate. What he does is he builds his own private racetrack, one similar to this one here, but in his case on the side of the Vatican Hill. But he needs a centerpiece. His great-grandfather Augustus in the Circus Maximus had erected an 80-foot obelisk. Caligula decides to do the same thing. Caligula orders a massive ship be built on a scale never tried before. It is longer than a football field and almost half as wide. And it has just one purpose to transport a massive 300-ton obelisk from Egypt to Rome. As it so happens, his obelisk is three feet taller than that of Augustus. Apparently, for obelisks, size matters. You can still see Caligula's mighty obelisk today, at the entrance to one of the holiest sites on Earth, St. Peter's Basilica. The more Caligula spends on his parties, games and festivals, the more the people love him for it. But the Senate is not happy with Caligula at all. He is hanging out with the kind of people that they really don't approve of. 
He's mixing with actors. He's going to lowbrow entertainment. This is not what they wanted from their emperor. But Caligula really doesn't care. 450 days into his reign, Caligula's non-stop partying comes to a tragic halt. <coughs> Drusilla, Caligula's sister and alleged lover, catches ill. She dies. Caligula is absolutely devastated. And he does something remarkable by ancient Roman standards. He has her declared a goddess. She's the first Roman woman to be awarded such an honor. The grumbling of the aristocrats grows even louder over Caligula's erratic behavior. But the emperor doesn't care. He's about to silence them with a campaign of humiliation and violence unlike anything ever seen before. Caligula's favorite quote, let them hate so long as they fear me. As the absolute ruler of the vast Roman Empire, Caligula has spent his first year and a half in power partying, hosting elaborate games and feasts. But he's also horrified Rome's senators with his cold-blooded slaughter of anyone who displeases him. Even his own 14-year-old cousin. But the Senate's complaints are going to fall on deaf ears. For them, the terror is just beginning. Caligula tried to do something different which was to create a new style imperial power, one that rejected a close partnership with the Senate. It was more of an idea of a king. He wanted to rule and he wanted the Senate to do his bidding. Caligula grows more and more annoyed with the senators. But he can't just get rid of them. The Senate has been around as long as Rome has. So he does the next best thing. He launches a campaign to humiliate them publicly and show everyone how useless they really are. Caligula convenes the Senate and he makes a remarkable speech. He accuses them of being hypocrites, of being traitors. And as evidence, he uses the papers from Tiberius that he had supposedly burned. Caligula goes back on the promise he made when he first came to power. He announces he's going to hold treason trials like Tiberius did before him, and encourages senators to report anyone who speaks out against the emperor. Then he mocks them, saying that they'll probably thank him for his insults. How are the Senate going to respond to this abject humiliation? They meet the next day. And they do exactly what Caligula had said they would do. They vote him honors. They lavish praise on him. But they have no choice. What else could they do? Caligula has exposed the reality of this relationship. The Senate may have thought itself in control, and it certainly had the social prestige, but it did not have the real political power when it came down to it. Caligula begins to humiliate Rome's proud aristocrats at every opportunity. In one imperial banquet, when a bunch of senators are trying to approach Caligula and talk to him about serious policy, he basically erupts with a fit of giggles. And they say, what's so funny? And he says, well, I was just thinking that with one simple nod, I could have all of your throats slit. Now, this guy has a really dark sense of humor. He knows he has absolute power over life and death. And he knows that they, the senators, know that. And he finds it amusing. Caligula had a sense of humor, at least in his own view. I mean, he was tremendously funny to himself. I think his sense of humor was largely based on making other people feel uncomfortable. One of the things he does which gives him a huge amount of pleasure is that he removes all of the privileges of seating at public performances. And he gets a real kick out of seeing these senators pushing and shoving so they can get the best seats. And then the ones who can't get the best seats, well, they're forced to go and sit with the slaves and the lower classes. He knew it would be a disaster. He knew 
what the effect would be. And he just lapped it up. He just loved it. He was really pushing a lot of buttons with uh, the more traditional factions of Rome. When his slaves carry him on a raised litter through Rome's streets, Caligula makes senators trot alongside him as they try to discuss matters of state. Imagine if today's congressmen were forced to trot alongside the president's limo. Caligula likes making the senators dress up in short little tunics like slaves and serve him at his meals. For these aristocrats of noble Roman heritage, it must be utterly humiliating. Sometimes we can relate to that sense of humor when he makes them uh, do humiliating things. Perhaps we also sometimes have met pompous people and wondered what it would be like to be able to do that to them. But Caligula can. It's this campaign of humiliation that explains the most famously bizarre story about Caligula. How he wanted to appoint his horse as a consul, the traditional head of the Senate. Caligula has this prized thoroughbred racehorse named Incitatus. I mean, he loves this racehorse. All sorts of honors were paid to this horse, including given the same breastplate that uh, Alexander the Great's horse uh, had. The story goes that one of his infamous banquets, Caligula invites out his horse, Incitatus, has him brought to his table at a place of honor. He's given food, water, everything in golden bowls. And when some of the members of the Senate ask, why is this happening? He responds, I'm thinking of making him consul. A lot of later historians have looked at the story as proof that the Emperor Caligula was insane. But it's just as likely that this was really just an elaborate prank aimed at insulting his distinguished guests. The senators would have cut off their right arm to be a consul. And here is Caligula. He gives all this to his horse. He wanted the Senate to do his bidding. By humiliating them, he was showing his irritation with a class that wasn't doing what he wanted them to do. The senators aren't just humiliated, they're paralyzed. Should they take his bizarre behavior seriously? One wrong word, and they could be killed. Late one night, Caligula summons a few of the most senior senators to his palace. They think he's going to consult with them about the growing unrest of the Germanic tribes along the River Rhine. Instead, he emerges in full costume and performs a little dance for them. At the end, he demands their applause. He knew it would be very funny to a larger populace. Uh, it'd be funny, in fact, to everyone except the senators themselves. Later historians, aristocrats themselves, use these stories to prove how crazy Caligula was. Many of the things which the sources say he does, which seem to us very childish and silly, and perhaps evidence of a kind of a madness, they were in fact designed to humiliate the senators. His campaign of humiliation seems to work. This dignity, this honor, this is what the senators really relied on. He really has taken everything from them. Senators begin prostrating themselves when addressing him, a tradition followed more in Egypt and the Far East than in Rome. He's turning into Rome's version of a divine pharaoh, but he needs to have children to establish a true family dynasty. Caligula gets married to the rather plain-looking daughter of a wealthy merchant. Her most attractive feature? She's already eight months pregnant. Whether the baby is his or not, nobody knows. She goes on to give birth to a little baby girl. This will have huge implications for the succession. But the really creepy part about the whole thing is that Caligula names the little girl Drusilla after his dearly departed sister. Drusilla's husband Lepidus had been next in line to the throne. Now, he and Caligula's two surviving sisters are out of luck. And with the Senate humiliated to the point of breaking, conditions are ripe for conspiracy. There are plenty of other folks amongst Rome's nobility that had just as good a claim to imperial rule. And these folks were dangerous. Caligula is still just halfway through his reign. The terror has only begun. He will create wild spectacles of debauchery, lead his armies to the edge of the world, 
and start a bloodbath back in Rome, killing people by the dozens. What will it take to finally push Rome over the edge? What Caligula does really pushes the envelope and is ultimately rejected. Caligula ruled the Roman Empire for only 1,400 days. Now, two and a half years into his reign, the people of Rome still adore him, thanks to his non-stop public festivals. He made a point very early on to stay on the good side of the people. He looked after them, he threw them games, he was good to them. For Rome's aristocrats in the Senate, he's been a nightmare, humiliating them at every opportunity. He annoyed the Senate, he got on their case, he irritated them as much as he possibly could. Caligula has shown no respect for the ruling class. So it's not surprising that some of Rome's most powerful aristocrats begin to plot ways to remove him from power. Caligula hears disturbing rumors about both of Rome's consuls the two officials elected by the Senate to lead them. And Caligula takes action. Out of the blue, Caligula has both consuls arrested, both executive officers, and that is unheard of. Imagine an American president arresting the senior senators of both parties. Now the charge is that they failed to honor him properly on his birthday. There is, of course, another theory. Conspiracy. Caligula tortures the arrested officials and uncovers a vast conspiracy to assassinate him. Eventually, these consuls are forced to commit suicide. The emperor soon discovers that the plot runs far deeper. It's not just a bunch of disgruntled senators. It's family. It's a devastating betrayal, one that shakes Caligula to his very core. It turns out that his sisters and his brother-in-law, Lepidus, are plotting to kill him before he can produce a male heir. Lepidus was next in line to the throne, but now it appears that he and Caligula's two sisters are at the center of a far-reaching plot to seize power. If you're in the imperial family, it isn't going to be like any other family. Anybody who is a relative of yours is, at the same time, your rival. Think of it as the Hollywood portrayal of the Mafia. That's how families treated each other. They were quite happy to bump each other off when, when they needed to. Caligula needs to make an example of them. He orders his brother-in-law Lepidus executed. Next, he forces his older sister Agrippina to walk 100 miles through the Roman countryside carrying her co-conspirator's ashes. And in a twisted touch, he banishes both of his sisters to the very same island where the Emperor Tiberius sent their mother to die just 10 years earlier. They could be used as a magnet for any opposition, for anybody who wanted to revolt against the Emperor. You can't have an idea of your sister as just your sister. She's your sister, but also your rival. Agrippina will have the last laugh. She will be the mother of an emperor, one nearly as infamous as her brother Caligula. His name is Nero. Also implicated in the conspiracy is one of Caligula's top generals, the commander of eight veteran legions. Caligula has him executed as well. But that leaves him with a problem, because that general was in charge of one of Rome's most dangerous frontiers. For the past 90 years, the empire's northern border has been the Rhine River. There, Roman troops have struggled to keep the fierce tribes of Germany from overrunning the empire. Caligula needs these troops to stay loyal. For any one of Rome's emperors, it was absolutely crucial to have the total loyalty of the legions, especially those on the dangerous frontiers in the armed provinces. He also needs them if he is to accomplish his real dream, to expand the empire 
and add glory to his name, Caligula heads north. It's always important for a new Roman emperor to do something successful militarily because that way he commands the loyalty of the army, which, let's face it, is how you in the end hold your power. As far as Caligula himself was concerned, being the son of Germanicus, he had to show himself an effective commander in the field. Caligula knows that the best way to cement his authority in Rome is by military conquest. The Romans respect their generals above all else. He needs a military campaign. The empire already stretches around the entire Mediterranean. But Caligula wants more. There's one place that hasn't seen a Roman army since Julius Caesar tried to invade it some 90 years earlier. And according to Caligula's spies, it's ripe for invasion now. Britain. What he wanted to do was not only to surpass his parents, but also to surpass Julius Caesar, who was the grandfather of all of them. Caligula appoints a new, more trusted general to shore up Rome's defenses along the Rhine and cover his flank. And then he leads four veteran legions westward to glory. Finally, Caligula and his troops arrive at the shores of the English Channel. And there, if the ancient sources are to be trusted, something truly bizarre happens. According to the ancient historian Suetonius, the Emperor Caligula gathers up his legions here on the beach in full battle formation, siege engines, the works, and he orders them to march against the sea. According to the story, Caligula is determined to conquer the very ocean itself. And that's not all. When that doesn't work, he orders the men to collect shells and stones in their helmets and in their tunics. What was he thinking? These were battle-scarred veterans. Clearly he was insane. For centuries, many have used this episode to prove that Caligula was insane. Why would he order his troops to pick up seashells on the beach? Could there be something else going on here? The answer might lie in what happened when the Romans successfully crossed the channel three years later. We know that when the legions of Claudius came to these shores, they mutinied. They refused to get on the boats. To them, this was the edge of the world. It took the commanders weeks to convince them to make the crossing. And it's likely that something very similar happened to Caligula. By Roman law, the punishment for mutiny is to kill every tenth man of the legions involved. They call it decimation. Killing a tenth. Caligula certainly would have no qualms about decimating his troops, but it might invite disaster. Caligula can't decimate his troops if they mutiny. After all, he's just executed their general, and the last thing he needs is the armies of Gaul rising up against them. So instead, he has them collecting seashells on the shore as a way to humiliate them. Having, you know, these tough, hardened Roman soldiers picking up seashells on the beach is the ultimate humiliation to the Roman man, if you like. For Caligula, the attempt to invade England is a devastating failure he won't dare admit to back home. Instead, he sends messages back to the Senate about his successful military maneuvers up to the edge of the Northern Sea. Reports which may have led to the rumor that he ordered his men to literally attack the ocean. Caligula's on his way back to Rome after his northern adventure. He's thinking he's done a fair amount uh, in the north. He's strengthened the Rhine defenses. He's prepared uh, the way for a full-scale Roman invasion of Britain. He's made it all the way to the English Channel. For this, he deserves a full Roman triumph. But the Senate's not in the mood to give him one. The triumph is an honored Roman tradition. Roman generals returning from a major military victory would parade their troops through the heart of Rome, cheered on by the people. It's one of the highest honors anyone can get in the ancient world. But triumphs must be awarded by the Senate, and they aren't about to give Caligula one. Instead, they simply send messages urging him to return so decisions can be made. Now he's starting to get angry. His answer to these embassies? I'll come, I'll come, but when I do come, 
I'm bringing this. And he taps the sword at his side. Caligula's decided, even though he hasn't conquered Britain, he finally is going to conquer the Roman Senate. Three years into his 1400-day reign, and the Emperor Caligula's position has weakened. He's had to brutally put down a conspiracy led by his own sisters. He has failed in his attempt to invade Britain. And now, the Senate is refusing him the honor of a triumphal procession through Rome. Caligula needs to remind everyone who's in charge. It was important not just to be the emperor, but to be seen to be emperor. Caligula decides it's time to celebrate his greatness with a public display of his power that people will talk about for generations to come. If he can't have a triumphal parade in Rome, he will stage a grand spectacle farther south, in a place Rome's aristocrats hold dear. The coastal resort town of Bahia. Bahia used to be the playground of Roman aristocracy. Think Martha's Vineyard for Rome's elite. By day, you could unwind in a lavish bathing complex. And by night, banquet on delicacies brought in by ship from all over the empire. Today, the ancient town of Bahia is almost entirely underwater, hidden beneath the Mediterranean Sea. But in Caligula's day, it was where the rich and famous kept their summer villas. It is here that Caligula decides to stage one of the oddest monumental spectacles in history. Caligula orders a fleet of ships sunk in pairs from here clear across to the busy port of Puteoli over there, effectively damming up the entire thing. Why? He wanted to build a bridge across the whole bay. It will be one of the most bizarre structures in history. A three mile long temporary bridge across the bay. It's not the first time someone's built a bridge using ships. The great Persian king Xerxes once created a pontoon bridge across a narrow strait between Turkey and Greece so he could march his troops across it. Now, 500 years later, Caligula hopes to outdo the famous Persian king. Caligula's engineers start dumping stones and earth on the sunken ships until they create a land bridge three miles long, clear to the other side. He even orders it paved with stones, like a real Roman road. Finally, the stage is set. Caligula puts on a garland of oak leaves, mounts his horse, and leads his legions across the causeway, from Bahia to Puteoli. It's not so much a parade as a piece of spectacular theater. Behind him, there are hundreds of soldiers in full battle dress, and it takes them the entire day to make the crossing. That night, Caligula and his troops party it up in Puteoli. They claim mock captives from the brothels of the port and drink late into the night. And then the next day, they do the whole thing in reverse, only this time, Caligula mounts a horse-drawn chariot, and half the population of Puteoli joins in the fun. The entire bridge is lined with torches, allowing the party to continue into the night. Brawls erupt, some even drown as things get out of hand. Historians have used Caligula's bridge to nowhere as proof of his utter insanity. But did the stunt actually serve a more strategic purpose? Imagine you're one of those Roman aristocrats watching from his villa as the party erupts across the bay. You'd be terrified. Caligula has unleashed utter chaos. He's essentially saying, I don't need your triumphs and I don't need your honors. I'm the great Caligula. He genuinely believed that people would admire him for it. And indeed, many people did. He was very popular in certain sectors of the community. A large part of this is, I want to party and I want to have a good time. But. I think there's a political dimension to this, that as an emperor, you want to make yourself grander and grander, more and more remote, more godlike. Roman emperors often created great monuments to show off their power. 
Rome's aqueducts and monumental arches, even temples like the Pantheon, were all funded and built by men hoping to win the hearts and minds of the people. But Caligula's projects aren't great public works. They seem to be just testaments to his own ego. When we see his building projects, it's interesting how many are focused on himself. Perhaps the greatest example of this is what he builds at Lake Nemi, just 20 miles south of Rome. This lake here and the forest which surrounds it is a very special place for Emperor Caligula because in antiquity, this was considered the sacred dwelling ground of Diana, who's the goddess of the forest and also the moon. Now it's here that Caligula used to come to escape the stress and havoc of the city of Rome. And it's here that he decides to build something unlike anything that had ever been constructed before and unlike anything that's ever been repeated since. It was a discovery only made in the 1930s when archaeologists working under Mussolini drained the lake. They discovered two enormous ships, bigger than anything historians thought the Romans capable of building at the time. They were both nearly a football field long and 75 feet wide. And when they read the inscriptions on the ship's pipes, they were stunned. With his unlimited funds, power, and ego, Apparently, Caligula decided to build the biggest yachts in the world. As you can see here, Lake Nemi is really quite small. It's less than a mile in diameter. Now, try to imagine in this relatively small space, a barge that's the equivalent of a football field in length. Now, imagine two of these barges floating out there. On shore, archaeologists painstakingly reconstructed the astounding ships. But although they had survived for almost 2,000 years at the bottom of the lake, they could not survive World War II. The ships were destroyed in an aerial bombardment. But the building that housed them still stands today as a testament to their enormity. The ships would have dwarfed the surrounding lake and inspired awe in any guest lucky enough to be invited aboard. Caligula builds these huge floating pleasure palaces to standards of luxury that have never been seen before. The ships are purpose-built for making wine-soaked cruises to nowhere. The floors are covered in mosaics from all over the Roman Empire. Each of the terracotta roof tiles were covered in bronze. The most impressive thing, I think, is the fact that the entire ship was outfitted with a piping system for both hot and cold water. In fact, hot water would run underneath some of the marble floors so that each one of these rooms would be nice and warm and cozy for the guests who were coming to Caligula ships. The richly decorated temple barge and pleasure ship serve as a vivid reminder of Caligula's wealth and power. He was very, very eager to point out there was a strong difference between an emperor and a senator. He's saying, I'm richer and I'm more powerful than even the highest class of the Roman world. He's also sending another message, which is, these ships were built hearkening in the style of the ancient ships that carried the pharaohs down the Nile. And he's saying, I'm going to rule, not like the previous two Roman emperors, I'm going to rule Rome with the absolute power of a pharaoh. His message was clear, because when the ships were discovered, they still had all their valuable bronze and marble fittings. It appears they were intentionally sunk intact after Caligula's death, most likely on orders of the Senate. They wanted no reminders of him. Many believe that the Nemi ships, like the Bridge of Boats at Bahia, are the ultimate vanity projects. Ways for Caligula to prove that he has no equals. He's on his way to becoming a divine pharaoh. And as those around him swiftly discover, to question him is to die. In order to make himself the undisputed ruler of Rome, he had to step on a lot of people. He had to step on a lot of corpses.
Caligula ruled Rome for just 1,400 days. But after surviving a conspiracy during his third year in power, Caligula has been avoiding Rome. He's been up north with the legions. He staged massive spectacles in Bahia and partied aboard his pleasure yachts at Lake Nemi. By displaying power, you showed that you were Augustus. You had the right to rule. Now on his 27th birthday, he returns to the capital with a vengeance, ready to slaughter anyone who might get in the way of his quest for unlimited power. If anyone whispers against the emperor, if anyone even looks at him the wrong way, they go on his list of enemies. But he no longer arrests them. Now, he just kills them all. One night, at a festive gathering, Caligula trots out three young prisoners, the sons of wealthy aristocrats. A slave says he overheard them criticizing the emperor. They're gagged, so they can't plead their case. And there, in front of the partygoers, Caligula has them beaten and tortured until they collapse. At the end of the bloody spectacle, the three boys lie dead on the ground. But Caligula isn't done. He doesn't want to hear any complaints from their wealthy fathers. So he sends his soldiers to their homes and has them killed as well. The bloodthirstiness was a, a way to shock and to awe and to horrify and hopefully serve as a deterrent. Well, we know it didn't because there was conspiracy after conspiracy. Caligula has those accused of treason whipped to death. He tortures them with steel and fire. But is this level of cruelty unusual in Rome? His reputation is certainly to be very cruel. But, I mean, who do you compare him with? The last ten years of his predecessor, Tiberius, weren't so very funny either. The difference with Caligula? He seems to enjoy it. He likes to have people killed slowly, so they know they're being killed. But it's not just random bloodlust that drives him. He does have a motive for the killings. Money. Caligula confiscates the property of any senator convicted of treason. At one point, a servant reports back to him, saying that a senator who'd been executed actually had no money to speak of. Caligula's reply? What a shame. He died in vain then. One ancient historian claims that, to raise money for his lavish lifestyle, Caligula turns his palace into a brothel forcing the wives and young sons of senators to prostitute themselves to all comers. Did Caligula really pimp out senators' wives on the Palatine Hill? This has been blown up out of all proportion. It's the way the sources at the time, who didn't like him, went out of their way to, to exaggerate and put a bad spin on anything that he did. There could be a grain of truth to the story. If he invites the family members of senators that he didn't trust into the palace, then they'd be under the control of the Praetorian Guard. It's a brilliant move because they're essentially hostages. Caligula realizes that he can no longer trust anyone he used to call his friend. He can't even trust anyone in his own family. Instead, he surrounds himself with former slaves who owe the emperor their freedom. Caligula's inner circle is now composed of his servants. These are his freedmen, people who owe their allegiance and everything to him. If you don't get on with your blood relations, this is a whole other option. These are people who are absolutely dedicated to you in the way that you might say that your blood relations ought to be, but aren't. He has very few other people that he can depend upon. He's got no one else left. One of Caligula's former slaves, Protogenes, becomes a man of huge influence feared by even the most powerful senators. Caligula has a secretary whose job it is to monitor the senators to make sure there are no conspiracies against him. One day, he went to the Curia, and as the senators filed past him, he said to one of them, 
Why do you greet me when you hate the emperor so? That was all the other senators needed to hear. They start to stab him with their pens and they start to rip into his skin, but then it gets worse. They chase him and they start to rip him apart. And ultimately, they have his entrails and his limbs, and they pile this up in front of the emperor. Because they knew that in order to demonstrate their loyalty to Caligula, they had to turn on this man. Caligula has ruled Rome for just 1,300 days. And in that time, he has gone from a beloved figure to becoming a true tyrant, ruling through fear and intimidation. He wasn't a emperor on the model of an Augustus or a Tiberius, which was a bundle of constitutional powers. It was more about Caligula actually seeing himself as a king rather than that of a traditional Roman emperor. That's the way that imperial power was going. Augustus and Tiberius, by default, had full rule, whether they liked it or not. And all Caligula was doing was being honest and saying, I want to be a king. No one dares to say no to him. His every word is law. When you're in that position, power becomes very, very, very seductive. And that, I think, is what happened to Caligula. But for Caligula's ego, it's not enough to have absolute power. Now, he wants to be worshipped as a living god. Did he really believe that the Roman people would accept him as a god? It certainly was not normal. But is that what finally pushes Rome to overthrow their emperor? Thirteen hundred days into Caligula's reign of terror, and the 27-year-old emperor's ego is over the moon. He has used his power to pursue his personal pleasures, and to murder any senators who disapprove of his behavior. But apparently, it's not enough. Now, he wants to be worshipped as a living god. After their death, emperors were deified. Caligula, however, had gone one step further by placing the emphasis on him as a god while he was alive. We have to remember that at a very impressionable moment in Caligula's life, he went to Syria with his father Germanicus, and they were worshipped as gods. And I think there is a way that that stayed with him into his adulthood. Typically, Caligula's desire to be worshipped begins as more of a joke. Caligula is a person that loves the art of pantomime. And in those performances, you're usually acting out mythology, Greek mythology, and you're acting in the guise of a god. Apparently from time to time, he dresses as the god Jupiter or Apollo, or even puts on a wig and pretends he's Venus, goddess of love. According to one story, he demands the senators come up on stage and bow before him, prostrating themselves, and they do. But Caligula wants to be worshipped for real, so he comes up with an ingenious plan to connect his palace to a nearby temple. Behind me are the three columns of the Temple of Castor and Pollux, which is one of the oldest and most sacred temples in Rome. Rising up behind that is the Palatine Hill, where the emperor's palace was, and he made the temple its vestibule so that it was a sort of porch um, to his extension of the palace. Caligula likes to sit between the two massive statues of Castor and Pollux, so that when anyone bows in prayer to the gods, they're praying to him as well. Being worshipped as a god was completely outrageous. We would think of it as outrageous, and it offended the Romans too. From another point of view, presenting yourself as a god was good politics, because it increased the awe and the respect for the emperor's person. It's true that Caligula was the first person to do this, 
But it's also worth noting that later on in the empire, in the third and fourth centuries, this became commonplace. Caligula was just very ahead of his time. Caligula spends more and more time hanging out at Rome's largest and most sacred site, Temple of Jupiter, dedicated to the king of the gods. And at one point he's standing in front of the statue of Jupiter himself, and he asks his friend that's with him, Apelles, the famous actor, which of us is more powerful? What would you answer? I mean, if you say that Jupiter is more powerful, then you're insulting the emperor. And if you say the emperor is more powerful, then you're insulting the king of the gods. It's really a no-win situation. Apelles hesitates. And for that hesitation, Caligula has him severely beaten. Caligula wants everyone to acknowledge his power, and he takes an even more outrageous step. He declares himself a living god. Caligula had a special temple built to his own deity, and inside it was a gold statue of him, which each day was dressed in whatever clothes he was wearing. And there were special priests and exquisite sacrifices made to him. Caligula has finally succeeded in his goal of being worshipped as a god, like the great pharaohs of Egypt. And this was a, an Eastern idea in the East. Monarchs were quite happy to be worshipped while they were alive, and Caligula was bringing this to Rome. But even in Rome's Eastern provinces, the idea of worshipping Caligula as a god isn't proving popular. In Emperor Caligula's attempt to create a divine imperial cult around himself, he does something really extreme. He tries to get a colossal statue of himself raised in this most sacred spot for the Jewish people, the Temple of Jerusalem. Now, had this succeeded, there would have been catastrophic repercussions, possibly mass suicides to prevent this thing from happening. Luckily, the local Roman governor managed to stall this statue getting raised. The response to the new cult of Caligula is not overwhelming. Here in Rome, it certainly was not normal for somebody to declare themselves a god during their lifetime. Which explains Caligula's next bombshell. Caligula announces to the Senate that he's leaving Rome and moving to Alexandria in Egypt. Alexandria itself is one of the most important cultural centers within the ancient world at this point in time. Alexandria certainly was a place where his style of autocratic leadership uh, would have been more acceptable. But why would Caligula want to move the capital of the Roman Empire away from Rome? Under Augustus's own rules, senators were not allowed to step foot in the province of Egypt. So in other words, what Caligula was saying, I'm going to set up a capital that no senator can step foot in. I can reign exactly as I like. And this was terrifying to Rome's ruling class. This is the biggest slap in the face for Roman society in general, particularly for the aristocracy. It is December in the year 40 AD. Caligula is making arrangements to move the imperial court to Egypt. He does not know it, but he will never see its shores. In fact, he has less than 30 days to live. Caligula had to be killed. It was now or never and the stakes were huge. The Emperor Caligula has terrorized Rome for nearly 1400 days. He has forced everyone to worship him as a living god. Now he's announced his plans to move the capital of the Roman Empire to Egypt. There, they know how to worship their rulers as divine kings. The notion of Caligula moving the capital to Alexandria, I think that this was used not as an idle threat. This was used as a real two-by-four to hit the collective skulls of the Senate with. There's another reason to leave. Caligula's latest campaign of violence against the Senate has made him a target. For Caligula, Rome has become a dangerous place. With enemies behind every door, it's time to get out of Rome. 
If he moves the imperial court to Alexandria, everyone in Rome will lose. The aristocrats, the Praetorian guards, even the people. It's the final straw. A high-ranking aristocrat is accused of conspiring against Caligula. The witness, the beautiful actress Quintilia, his lover. Caligula has the Praetorian guard torture her, beat her, whip her. She says nothing. Moved by her loyalty and her now disfigured face, Caligula lets her go. But, according to the story, on her way out, Quintilia taps the foot of one of the Praetorian soldiers. It's a signal that she's revealed nothing. Turns out there is a conspiracy brewing, and the Praetorian guards are part of it. The Praetorian guards are getting increasingly pissed off with their benefactor Caligula. If he moves the seat of government to Alexandria, then they lose their power and influence. One man in particular becomes the focus of the conspiracy, Cassius Chirea. Chirea is the head of the Praetorian Guard, putting him in the perfect position to ambush the Emperor. But why would he get involved with a conspiracy? The ancient historians say that Cassius Chirea was often the butt of Caligula's cruel jokes. The Emperor mocked his effeminate voice and questioned his sexuality in public. But Chirea's motives were probably more complex than that, and he certainly wasn't acting alone. Powerful senators are also backing the plot. Their goal is not just to kill Caligula, but to restore the Senate to power, so it can rule Rome as it used to, before there was an emperor. It all goes down during the celebration of the annual Palatine Games next to Caligula's palace. That afternoon, the emperor retires to his quarters for a midday bath and a meal. To get back to the palace, Caligula doesn't take the same paths as everyone else. Instead, he enters into a series of subterranean corridors like this one that honeycomb the Palatine Hill, joining different parts of the palace. And these subterranean passageways are known as the Cryptoporticus. The Cryptoporticus is deserted as the emperor walks ahead of his guards. It's the perfect place for an ambush. Cadea follows the emperor Caligula down into the Cryptoporticus and he's got to get his attention and stop him. He does so by asking what the daily password is. Now, in typical fashion, Caligula responds with an obscenity. It's in that moment that Karea draws his sword and strikes. But Karea is not acting alone. Out of the shadows step many conspirators, and they begin stabbing the body of Caligula. They are senators and tribunes and even a freed slave of Caligula's. And they will not stop until his body is lying in a pool of his own blood. Eat, eat, eat. Down below the palace, down in the forum, a crowd starts to gather. The rumor is that Caligula is dead. Can it be? This is the guy that threw the parties and kept them entertained. This is the guy that's going to be living for a very long time as a young emperor. And now the party's over? The Senate convenes. The mood is tense. Everybody is very confused. What are they going to do now? Suddenly, all these senators that had been bowing and scraping to Caligula are now denouncing him as a tyrant. They even think of returning to the Republic. Perhaps this empire has been a mistake. Perhaps what they need to do is go back to their old ways. Meanwhile, the Praetorian Guards continue to hunt down the Imperial family. The Praetorian Guards search the palace for the rest of Caligula's family. When they find his wife, they put her to the sword. And his baby daughter, Drusilla, her head is bashed against the wall. No blood descendant of Caligula can survive. As the Praetorian guards go from room to room, they stumble across Caligula's uncle Claudius, who's gone into hiding. Now Claudius is convinced he's next on the chopping block, but that's not what happens. As the Senate is pondering what to do next, Chirea and the Praetorian guards put their own plan into action. 
The Praetorian Guard take Claudius back to their camp just outside the gates of Rome and proclaim him emperor. This was their plan all along. They don't want to return to the Republic. As long as there's an emperor to protect and serve, they have the power and they have the influence. Claudius, Caligula's elderly uncle, becomes the next emperor of Rome. Claudius is always portrayed as this slightly bumbling fool, but he was a much, much brighter man than given credit for. And there's some reason to believe that Claudius himself was behind the uh, assassination. Claudius certainly benefited from it. The Senate get word that the Praetorian Guard have declared Claudius the new emperor, and they have been outmaneuvered. The Senate's dream of regaining power over Rome is now dead. If there was a window, it was just a tiny crack, and it closed very, very quickly, and it was never to reopen again. After Caligula's death, the Senate does its best to remove all traces of him. They declare a damnatio memoriae, a damnation of his memory. Inscriptions are chiseled out, statues are actually taken down and smashed, and every physical representation of the emperor is completely removed from the public record. And they really condemn his memory and really condemn that image of him. But it is too late. Caligula's 1400 days of terror may be over, but he has redefined the role of emperor. His incredible appetite for both pleasure and bloodshed will be imitated by later emperors, drunk on imperial power, and Rome will never be the same. He really shows us what might happen if there were no rules. He was incredibly young when he came to the throne. You gave this raw man absolute power of the world, and of course it corrupted him. He goes down in the history books as one of the worst. There's a reason why he's assassinated so early on in his reign. Whether or not he was insane, or simply evil. Caligula's mother and eldest brother arrested on the charge of treason. And they're ultimately exiled out to a barren rock in the middle of nowhere. His mother starves herself to death. And his eldest brother commits suicide. Tiberius has Caligula's other brother thrown into a cell beneath the palace. There, the young man starves to death. But not before trying to eat his own mattress. The death of his parents and brothers will have a profound influence on the young Caligula. If your nearest relations disappear rather casually, as it were, this puts some toughness in you and um, makes you pretty unpleasant. It's not really surprising that he ends up slightly unhinged. But Tiberius spares the young man, at least for a time. He only survived because he was too young to really be a threat. When Caligula turns 17, he receives a summons from the emperor. He is to come to Tiberius's magnificent palace on the island of Capri, off the coast of Naples. On Capri, the emperor has set up a new imperial court where he can do anything he wants, far from prying eyes. Folks thought when Tiberius called him to, the, uh, to his court at Capri that that was going to be the end of uh, the young Caligula. It is very difficult to understand what Caligula would have been thinking when he arrived here at Tiberius's villa on Capri. It was probably a combination of both apprehension and excitement. Apprehension because of what had already happened to his family and what could potentially happen to him and yet enthusiasm because he was arriving here at the true seat of Roman imperial power under Tiberius. When Caligula arrives at the palace, to everyone's surprise, Tiberius welcomes him and takes him under his wing. Tiberius is getting older and he needs to find a successor. The only option is that of Germanicus' son, Gaius Julius Caesar, otherwise known as Caligula. It will be Caligula's first taste of what it truly means to be emperor. But the world Caligula enters on Capri is unlike anything he or anyone has seen before.
cruel. 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 Not a nice guy. He ruled the world's mightiest empire with sadistic brutality. He was vindictive and dangerous and irresponsible. His reign of terror lasted just 1,400 days. Yet even today, everyone knows his name. He really is the personification of evil. The stories that we have, the things that they tell us are quite extreme. Most say he was crazy, but was he? Psychopathic, evil, oh yes. Clinically insane. This is the story few know behind one of the most infamous figures of the ancient world. This is Caligula. Caligula's story takes place in the first century AD, less than 20 years after the death of Jesus Christ. The Roman Empire is the world's greatest superpower. With its vast armies, Rome dominates over two million square miles around the Mediterranean Sea, an area occupied today by 47 countries. Its total population is estimated at 55 million, which means one in every four people on Earth live under Roman law. And all of it is under the control of one man, a 24-year-old named Caligula. Even though he ruled more than 2,000 years ago, today Caligula is still remembered for being a madman. He was the original over-the-top emperor. You have the stories of the horse, you have the stories of him sleeping with his sister, and the stories got around. We know the stories now, we're still talking about them 2,000 years later. According to one story, a senator's wife catches Caligula's eye, and he invites her and her husband to dine with him, an offer they can't dare refuse. In the midst of the banquet, Caligula has her brought back to his private chambers, and he enjoys her while his guests are enjoying their meal. To make matters worse, afterwards, Caligula returns to the banquet, and he goes on to tell all of the guests, including the woman's husband, exactly how well the woman had performed. Stories like these have kept Caligula's name alive, but are they true? The ancient sources, of course, show him as an evil tyrant who deserved to die. It's really hard to sift through and understand who Caligula was. We do know that he was excessive. We do know that he was vindictive. We do know that he was paranoid. But was he really as crazy as they say? He's not an out-and-out, -out crazy, completely self-destructive person. To understand if Caligula was as mad as history has labeled him, you have to take a closer look at all of the stories of brutality and excess. And it starts on his first day as emperor. Caligula's reign begins with a triumphant procession up the Appian Way, Rome's most famous road. Huge crowds cheer him on and throw flowers in his path. To the people, the fresh-faced 24-year-old represents a new hope. He isn't especially well-known, and there are huge expectations on him. When he reaches Rome, Caligula heads right to the Curia Julia, the traditional meeting hall of the Roman Senate. He needs them to legitimize his new role as emperor. For centuries, the Senate, made up of men from the wealthiest and most distinguished families, was in charge of Rome. But 68 years ago, everything changed when Augustus Caesar seized power over the Senate and all of Rome. Now, the empire is ruled by one man. Augustus brought peace to the empire for 41 years. His adopted son, Tiberius Caesar, ruled for the next 23 years. 
but by the end of his reign, Tiberius wasn't winning any popularity contests. At the end of his reign, the people hated Tiberius. He raised their taxes, he cut down on public games and festivals. He was stingy with the wealth of the empire. That's why they put their hopes in Caligula. Now, Augustus' great-grandson, Caligula, is ready to step into the role as Rome's third emperor. But first, he needs the Senate's approval. You have to remember that the Senate had just been through a terrible period under the Emperor Tiberius. The last part of his reign was full of fear, was conspiracy trials, senators turning on each other, and they really hoped for something better from Caligula. As far as the senators and the people of Rome are concerned, Caligula has the perfect pedigree. His mother was the granddaughter of the popular Augustus, and his father Germanicus was one of Rome's greatest and most honored generals. As a child, Caligula grew up in remote outposts like this, among rough and ready soldiers. But as the son of the commander, very aware of his privileges. Caligula's parents constantly remind the young boy of his noble heritage and the high expectations they have for him. From the beginning, his mother groomed him for greatness. She dressed up little Gaius Germanicus in a tiny soldier's uniform and paraded him round the camp to win over the soldiers. It worked. They loved him. They called him Caligula, Little Boots. And even though he hated the name, it stuck. Caligula is only seven years old and living in Syria where his father Germanicus was on assignment. Suddenly, his father falls ill. Worse, it turns out he was poisoned. A terrible way for a soldier to go. And rumor has it, it was on the orders of the emperor himself. The emperor at the time is Tiberius, Caligula's great uncle. He feared Germanicus's growing popularity among his soldiers and the people. So he ordered his best general poisoned to death. Caligula watches his father die for the crime of being too popular. It's a lesson in the ruthlessness of imperial power that he would never forget. But Tiberius doesn't stop there. When Caligula and his grieving family return to Rome, the emperor continues to persecute them, convinced that they are still a threat to his power. Tiberius has both. It's a hellhole of despotism and debauchery. Most of this villa was actually decorated with pornographic imagery on the walls, a bit like the ancient Roman equivalent of the Kama Sutra. Tiberius was having young boys and young girls running around in the gardens outside of the villa, scantily clad, having sexual encounters, and he would sit there and watch. In his large indoor pool, Tiberius swims naked with his young guests, affectionately calling them his minnows. Caligula is encouraged to join in, and he does, because the punishment for upsetting the emperor is often death. Tiberius likes to have his victims hurled off the rock cliffs next to his palace, 1,000 feet down into the sea. The closer you got to imperial power, the higher the stakes. Death was a daily threat if you were on Capri. On Capri, Caligula receives an education in violence, pleasure, and the intoxicating effects of absolute power. We all know about the orgies, that's the bit everyone remembers. But the important thing to remember is, is, is that he was a captive. He was being held there effectively against his will knew how to survive under very, very close watch. But while he was being watched, he was also watching. Caligula knows that if he can survive life on Capri, he will inherit his great uncle's empire. Caligula spent six years living here on Capri with Tiberius. This had a profound impact upon him. 
It taught him not only how to wield absolute power, but also taught him about how to enjoy himself. Caligula pretends to go along for the ride and secretly waits for his chance to take the throne. Caligula knows that the surest way to power is to secure the loyalty of the Praetorian Guard, the men hired to protect the Emperor. The Praetorian Guard are the Emperor's personal protection force. They go wherever he goes. But these aren't palace guards. These are well-trained, well-armed soldiers. Best to think of them as a cross between Navy SEALs and the Secret Service. Caligula befriends the captain of the Praetorian.